one of the things, it's a shallow thing, but one of the things that I miss the most, and I think many people did, throughout the fall when we weren't able to gather together in person and uh, go about our old normal way of life, one of the things that I missed out on most was the pageantry of high school football. And there's nothing like Friday night lights. The chill of the air, the smell of the fresh cut painted grass on the fields that still have grass these days. The entire community gathered together, the band playing the fight song, and on and on and on. I was so involved in school and around sports and around the pageantry all the time. And then when I went back into coaching, I spent 10 years coaching in high school sports. And throughout that time, no matter what school I was at or what school we traveled to or wherever we were, nothing ever changed. The, the colors might have changed, the people might have changed, but the pageantry was the same. And as I remember back on my high school days, one of the highlights of the fall, every fall was homecoming week. The spirit weeks that would go around, the overhyped game prep in practice, and of course, the parade. And the one time that as kids, you are the focus of everything that goes on. You feel so important. There might, the principal might be in the parade, uh, the mayor might be in the parade, but the majority of the entire parade and the, the whole experience is gathered around the children, around the youth, the kids. It makes you feel important. The band marched, the football team rode in cars, the other teams rode in cars, and all of that wonderfulness. I had a flashback to those parades a little bit this week as I was going through the psalm that Brian just read for us, the 89th psalm. In this psalm, this song of praise to God, the writer sort of envisions his life as a homecoming-like celebration. Let's take a look at that together again. First, imagine the cheer from the crowd for this celebration and then we get this in verse 11. Powerful is your arm. Strong is your right hand. Your right hand is lifted high in glorious strength. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. You see, God is like the grand marshal of a parade in this passage, sitting high atop his rightful throne, a throne that is built, that its foundations are righteousness and justice. Unfailing love and truth, they march ahead as the crowds cheer with joyful praise and worship. The grateful follower of God, the writer of the psalm, declares that happy are those who, are, who hear the joyful call of worship for they will walk in the light of the Lord's presence. So friends, I tell you that to tell you this, that joy abounds when we stay in step with God, when we follow His ways, when the light of Christ's presence reflects our life. This is what Jesus told His first followers as well. In John chapter 8, He says this to them. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. So friends, when we follow Jesus, we no longer have to walk in darkness. We don't have to stumble around in our hurts and our habits and our doubts and our hang-ups anymore. Jesus drives that darkness out of my life. Jesus is the only one who can do that. Friends, that's why I am a follower of Jesus. And I've discovered this about myself, that when I'm following Jesus, when I am walking in the light of his path, when I'm walking in the light of his way, what happens, and this might be hard to believe, but I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, I'm a better friend, I'm a better coworker, I'm a better pastor, I'm a better leader, and I'm a better follower of Christ. Why? Because the light of Jesus' presence drives away my old, dark passengers that used to ride with me, anger and anxiety and fear of losing control. They used to steer my life and my relationships and my reactions, and instead now Jesus has come into my soul and Jesus has driven the darkness away. He is the light of the world. Jesus tells us that. And if we will just follow him, then friends, the darkness, we don't have to walk around in it anymore. I don't know about you, but that sounds wonderful to me. 
amazing, incredible. That sounds like something I want. I think it's something you probably want as well. This series, we've been learning how to walk in the light, how to walk in the way, walk with God, walk with Jesus. We've been learning how we can walk with confidence in God. Even in the midst of trouble, we can walk in his light. We can pray and praise and worship because God's love is unfailing. It never changes. If you're in trouble today, walk in the light of Jesus' love. Friends, we've also learned how we can walk blamelessly, not perfectly, but blamelessly in our heart after God's own heart. How we can not just study God's word, but we can delight in God's word. We can gather together in community online, even as we are now. A reminder to engage in the comments with one another, say hi to one another, welcome each other, pray for each other as you were online this morning. If you're in and whether we're in person, keep coming back in person. Keep coming back to the online gatherings. That is community. That is authentic community. And friends, we've also learned how we can walk obediently with God. Discover how we can have our have to becomes our want to, and our desire to please God pleases God. The way we discover that is through times of Sabbath. How many of y'all took time this week for a, a distinct, intentional Sabbath? in times of silence and stillness and solitude. We're going to continue that series today about walking with God. We're going to learn about the places and the spaces where we can continue to meet God and to meet Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement of which we are a part, he called these things we've just talked about means of grace. That's what we've been learning about over recent weeks. Up until today, though, our focus has really been on our individual walk with God. And friends, I can tell you that I've needed that. I hope you have too. I know that I now can walk better in the light of Jesus for all the ways that it blesses me in my life. But today we're going to talk about learning about another means of grace. Instead of what John Wesley called works of piety, drawing closer to God, today we're going to talk about works of mercy, where the movement from, moves from the light that's given to me to the light that I take into the world. And I want to tell you up front, this can be challenging. And here's why, because it is for me challenging. I know it is for a lot of people. It's uncomfortable, right? A means of grace is showing mercy to other people. It can be inconvenient to show mercy to other people. It can be inconvenient to help other people. Sometimes, friends, we get so focused on our individual walk with God. And that is a good thing. We've got to look where our feet are first. Don't get me wrong, we need to do that. But we get so wrapped up in that, as we go deeper in our relationship with God, we come to a crossroads. The further down the road we go, we, the more we walk in step with Jesus, we have choices to make about where we're going to go. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King always said that inside each one of us, we have what's called, what he called a drum major instinct. We want to be the head of that parade. We want to be the head of the procession with the eyes on us, with folks just marching behind us, marching to our own beat, marching to our own cadence in our direction. And if friends, if we're not wise and if we're not careful, the focus of our Christian life can become selfish, self-centered, and can become a self-improvement plan, which is all about me, myself, and I. And I know this because there was a time in my life where I lived that way. Too often in my life, I have made the Christian life about my own comfort and convenience in a well-disguised pursuit of my own ego and not in pursuit of God, and not in pursuit of God's will and dreams for my life. Instead of reflecting the light of Jesus, being that, reflecting that to the world in me and through me, I have wanted to lead the parade, to climb atop the Grand Marshal's chair, to live life my way, and then ask Jesus to bless that. Friends, that's not what we're called to do. What we're talking about today, and I, I know it's going to be uncomfortable, but this is where the rubber meets the road in life, in our faith lives. I know that, that all of you know what it's like to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable, and I don't like it, and I don't think you do either, but sometimes following Jesus, sometimes that means it is difficult. It may not literally cost us our lives, but it very well might cost us our convenience, our comfort, and our desire for self-control. 
as Jesus called us, this is one of those places where we are called to take up our cross and follow him, leaving the world behind. For me to grow, for you to grow in our Christian life, our Christian development, I have to get the attention off of me. I have to resist my own drum major instinct and live selflessly. When I continually consult Sean about what leads to, about the way that leads to life, it always leads to dead ends and to dark places. But when I consult Jesus, when I follow Jesus, it leads to life and light. Friends, in the kingdom of God, we can't keep what we don't give away. What I mean by that is to say this, we can't hoard for ourselves the grace that we've experienced in Christ Jesus. We can't hoard that for ourselves. And since Jesus is already at work in the world, that means we don't have to do that sharing of the grace alone. We're empowered to do it. We're encouraged. We're commanded to do it. But we don't have to do it alone. God is faithful and God is calling you and is calling me and us to show mercy to others. In the movement that John Wesley started, that Methodist movement, what it meant to show mercy was to show care for the poor, to visit the imprisoned, to look out for the lonely, the sick, the widowed, the orphaned. It means loving the people that nobody else wants or sees. Jesus says, out of his love and grace, follow me. Follow me. And here's the question we're going to look at today in relation to that. Why should I join Jesus on his mission? Why should I join Jesus in his mission engaging in works of mercy? Why should I be inconvenienced? Why should I feel uncomfortable? Why should I give up control? Why should I step into uncomfortable situations? Well, there's three reasons why that we're going to talk about this morning. And Jesus is already at work in the world, friends. We just need to join him. So, and here's the whys. Number one, it honors God when we do so. It honors God. Jesus lived his life on earth for the approval and the applause of God the Father alone. That's one of the things I love about Jesus, and what I love about the ideal of the Christian life, is that he was so secure in his identity of who he was, that he only lived his life for an audience of one, God the Father. He didn't worry about what anybody else thought. He didn't worry about what anybody else wanted him to do. Something that me, that you, that many of us struggle with, this anxiety, this desire for control, the desire to be liked, people approval. I struggle with that. I know a lot of you do as well. And it's why I want to follow Jesus into this light, because what Jesus does is he lives his life in worship to God. And he invites us to live our life in worship to God as well. We can engage in worship, friends, when, whenever we show mercy and kindness. Jesus says whenever we feed the hungry, give something to drink to the thirsty, whenever we welcome a stranger, whenever we clothe the naked, whenever we draw near to the sick or visit those in prison, something supernatural or amazing takes place. Look with me in Matthew 25. You may know this already. And what does Jesus say? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. To me, Jesus says. You see, many of us, we get too narrow of a view of worship. What it means to worship, yes, it means to gather together like we are doing virtually now. Yes, it means singing along to hymns and praising God through music. And friends, I, let me admit, I'll be singing the songs all week. When I, we put in the, the order of worship, I have decided to follow Jesus. Ever since then, I keep catching myself humming, I, will, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, where did that come from? But that music invades our soul, that worship invades our soul, but that isn't the only way to worship. God's Spirit speaks through the songs, but can I tell you, friends, that worship is far more than singing and praying and listening. Worship is our lives. Worship is our living it's the way that we engage in the works of mercy because Jesus says that whenever we do that, whenever we show mercy to somebody in need, somebody that's in darkness, we worship God. We're doing it to God, to Jesus. And here's what that means. Whenever somebody comes by our office or calls our office in need of assistance, whenever somebody comes to one of the food pantries that we support and they are welcomed in, whenever that stranger is welcomed in, we know that people are not just coming for stuff 
and for things. People are coming to know they are people of sacred worth and that they are loved. What's happening in that moment supernaturally, what's happening is Jesus in his distressing disguise is welcomed in and mercy is shown to a stranger. Jesus said, whenever you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. That means that when someone sits down with a sister or a brother in Christ and asks, how is it going? Not how, how are you doing? How is it with your soul? How can I pray for you in your walk with Christ? How can I support you? What's said in scripture becomes true in that moment. In real life, right then, right now, God becomes a father to the fatherless. He cares for the orphan. Are you catching on to this? Jesus says, whenever you've done this to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. See, what's happening in that moment, and you can't see it with regular eyes, but you can see it with the eyesight that the light of Jesus reveals. We've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters. You've done it to who? To Jesus. When our military fellowship ministry provides a safe place for veterans to share and to be loved, regardless of what church or any church they might attend, if they attend church, we're serving Jesus. When our community garden team welcomes someone in to help or takes their produce to those in need, we're serving Jesus. When you welcome someone visiting Buck Hall Church, even welcome them online. When you welcome someone into our church that is a stranger, when our volunteers take communion out to those who are homebound, when our ladies' fellowship collects and bakes and takes goodies to our first responders who spend their days protecting our community, when we provide meals and support to those who are healing from surgery or illness or those who are grieving, friends, what are we doing? Who are we serving? Jesus says, you are serving me. That is worship, friends. That is worship. That is what God has called us to. And that's what we are singing praise to God through our actions. We're saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. When we share that light with those who are in a dark place, when we are loving like Jesus has called us to love. And that is the first reason we need to follow Jesus in his mission. The number, reason number two, look with me at this. It transforms the world. That's why. It transforms the entire world in an amazing movement of mercy and grace and love. Look at me at what happens. There. This great exchange. As our darkness is exchanged for Jesus' light for those who follow him. That's why the Psalms say, by the way, happy are those who walk in the light of his presence. If you meet any of our folks who serve in any of these ministries or any of our other ministries, you'll find that they are happy in Jesus. Why? Because they are walking in the light of Jesus Christ. And here's what Jesus promised to his disciples that we see lived out in moments like that. Matthew 5, Jesus says this. He says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, I learned that song in kindergarten and pre-kindergarten in school, right? Let your light shine. You are the light of the world. Don't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. It is still a light of mine, right? We, we all learned that song if you grew up in church. But friends, here's the reality. That song isn't wrong. We are called to be lamplighters. That's who Jesus expects us to be. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to shout and holler into the darkness, into the void by ourselves. We don't have to try to overcome the darkness by ourselves, trying to drown out the darkness with our own voice or our own powers. We have Jesus Christ we have the light of the world. We can light candles to chase that darkness away. And those candles that we light, we light not with fire, but with the light of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus, to let the light of Jesus shine. And who do we shine that light to? All. To everyone. I want to share with you a story about a shining example, pardon the pun, 
a shining example of light being shined and overcoming the darkness. About a quarter of a century, 25 years ago, at the church called the Rock of Our Salvation Church in downtown Chicago, some of the roughest neighborhoods and streets of America, especially back then, the leadership of this church and of a ministry group called Urban Circle Ministries were determined to transform for Jesus the rough and frankly scary neighborhoods that surrounded the church. It's amazing to look back on that story and see how confident and, dare I say, happy those leaders of the church were and how merciful they were to their community, what they were willing to sacrifice for their neighbors. They had bought over time several neighborhoods or several buildings in the neighborhood, trying to, from the ground up, initiate this transformation of the neighborhood for Jesus Christ. But there was one building they had not yet been able to transform. It was a giant high-rise in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago. The Chicago Tribune had called this building the Murder Building. This high-rise was abandoned. It was covered in graffiti and trash. And so many acts of violence had taken place in and around this structure. And it was called by the Chicago Tribune the Murder Building and a monument to the urban slums. The leaders of the church were determined, though. They said, guess what? We're going to save up our money. And a bunch of our leaders, a bunch of us together, are going to put our money together, put our resources together as a church. And we're going to buy that building. And in the name of Jesus, we are going to tear it down. And guess what, friends? They did. About a year, took about a year process to do it, but they bought the building. And they tore it down. When the wrecking ball came, when the truck with the wrecking ball came to that building, the people in the neighborhood who were scared to go out of their house for groceries stepped out of their houses to watch what was happening. People lined the streets and applauded with, with joy and had tears of joy streaming down their face. Because the light of Jesus was coming into the darkest of places and the people came to see the parade. About a year after that, the mayor of Chicago at the time, Richard Daly, and all the local Chicago media and a lot of the national media came back to the neighborhood to see the church unveil a completely rebuilt neighborhood. Apartments for single-parent families, a new ministry center, a new school had been started, and the light of Jesus, friends, shined throughout that neighborhood. The murder building had given way to the author of life, Jesus Christ. Friends, that's having church. That's the church. When the people of God began to see and to enjoy that place, when the neighbors began to see that place, they applauded and they shouted and they cheered. Oh, happy are those who walk in the light of God. For his light has come into this world and darkness cannot overcome it. Amen. Friends, if you're not already a part of our different ministry works, our mercy ministry works, our community garden, our food pantry efforts, our part partnership with St. Thomas, Food Pantry, our partnership with Volunteer Prince William. You can sign up to be a part of any of those ministries at any time. Contact the office, contact me, uh, contact any part of our congregation. They can get you in touch with the folks who run those ministries. But here's why you should get involved if you're not already involved. Number three, it transforms me. It transforms you. When you and I engage in these works of mission and join Jesus on his mission, it transforms our lives. As I think back on my life, I am wrecked today with joy because of what God has done in my life. When I trusted him in an imperfect way and stepped out on faith, even when I didn't want to, when I served him, it transforms my life. And it can transform your life. Look with me at what Jesus says, because it is true. In Matthew 5, verse 7, you can trust in these words. God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You see, I realized this week in studying that Jesus said these words in Aramaic. Sometimes we, we, in my brain we think Jesus said them in the New Testament Greek, but he didn't. He would have said them in Aramaic to those who were around him. And in Aramaic, the word merciful means, literally means to get under somebody's skin an ability to see and experience what somebody else is going through, to get under their skin. As I read that, I thought, you know what? There's a lot of folks who get under my skin, and I don't want to bless them. I want to curse them. I want to tell them to knock it off. 
It's the little things. It's the ridiculous stuff. Somebody takes 15 items into the 10-item express checkout lane at Harris Teeter. Here's what God is doing in my life. I've got a long way to go, but Jesus is saying, Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. And what he's saying is the same unique skill set that we all have, to be honest, this skill set of getting under other people's skins, of annoying other people and allowing people to get under our skin, that we need to turn that skill set all around, turn it on its head. Jesus reverses that and says, now bless them by showing them mercy and grace. Take this light and shine it and share it with other people, for they are blessed, are the merciful. I told you in the first week of this series several weeks ago about a man named John who begrudgingly went on a youth ministry trip who only went because they didn't have enough adults to go. He didn't believe in ministry. He didn't believe in going on mission trips. He didn't believe in what we were doing. He did it so his kid could go and so that he wouldn't feel bad about his kid missing out on this. Now, what I didn't tell you is just how adamantly opposed he was to doing this kind of work. He thought it was a complete waste of the church's money. He said, there's stuff we can do in and around our own church and in and around our own little tiny neighborhood. Why are we going out there to to see other things and do other things for people that we'll never meet again? Well, as God will do, as uh, John was ramping up, as his trip was preparing to happen, and John didn't yet know he was going, God stirred up some people in that church. And we started having all these conversations about what it is we gain from mission trips, why we do the work that we do. In fact, at one point, John told a council meeting of the church, he said, I don't care what you do, but don't spend a dime of my giving on that, because I think it's ridiculous. It had gotten under his skin, right? He didn't want anything to do with it. Well, that's one of the reasons why the leader of the ministry group, when it came time to needing an adult, the first call was to John. It was an invitation for John to come and serve. She was pretty sure John would say yes because he loved his kids and he wanted to be a part of that project. He wanted to do it with his kids, but he didn't believe in what they were doing. But he said yes. And you know what happened throughout that week and throughout his time on that mission trip? I told you, yes, he came to know Jesus. He came to accept Jesus as a Savior. But the people that we served with, they began to get under his skin. He began to be merciful when he talked about them. When someone asked John a few years later as time went on and he got more and more involved, that that man now, not only is he a follower of Jesus, he's a youth ministry leader. He organizes multiple mission trips a year, or he did before the pandemic. He's thrown his whole life into serving God through mission. And someone asked him a few years after that trip, he said, what is it that's changed you? What is it that's changed in this church and in these trips that's made you change your opinion?" And he said, the biggest thing that's been transformed is me. He was the one who was transformed and changed. You know how that story ends. That's the power of our saving grace of Jesus Christ, the power of walking alongside him in mission. When we've done it to the least of these, our brothers and sisters, we've done it to Jesus. That's why we ought to engage in these works of mercy. And my prayer for you today is that you would see someone doing a work of mercy around here. And it would start to get under your skin. I hope that it would aggravate you so much that you turn around and you are transformed so mightily for Jesus Christ. That you begin to do something even greater than that which you witnessed for the kingdom of God. I pray that the enemy, we face an enemy, I pray the enemy would get so mad so mad that he would run from you. And I pray that the love of Jesus would fill you up, fill you up to the overflowing of the brim and transform this entire community for the glory of God. That is my prayer for you and for our community and for our church this morning. If you're sitting with somebody this morning, look at your neighbor and say, you're getting under my skin. You're getting under my skin. Friends, if You want your life to be transformed. Jesus shows us the way. Jesus shows us the way to follow. We're to walk the same way that he walked. We are to go to the people that nobody else wants, that nobody else sees. People that the least, the last, the lost. We should join Jesus in this mission of engaging in works of mercy 
because it honors God, it transforms God, or transforms the world, and it transforms our lives. Friends, that's why we should engage in these acts of mercy. That's why the, what's happening, the world is waiting, the world is desperate for this love and this grace and this mercy, just waiting for it to be poured out, even if they can't make it. I'll end with this, one final story for you. A few years ago, about three or four years ago, on a dark, cold subway train in the middle of winter in New York City, and if you've ever been on one of those trains in New York City in the cold winter, you know how cold those subway trains can get. There was a shivering homeless man who sat almost naked on a subway seat, freezing to death, shivering. People got on the train, people got off the train, but if people got on that car, they would move to the ends of the car. They'd get away from this man. They wanted to stay away from him, to avoid him at all costs. And then something incredible happened, and I want you to watch this clip. Friends, that man literally gave him the shirt off his back. He had to walk back out of that subway in just that undershirt, but he didn't care. He was willing to sacrifice to make sure this man could find some warmth. That man got under his skin. And friends, I pray today that mercy gets under your skin. That you can't stand to see a, another person without. That you can't stand to see another person shaking in the throes of addiction. I pray that you can't stand to see another person go without a job. Go without a roof over their head food on their table. I pray that mercy would take over us, take over you so much that you can't stand to see another person suffering in sin and struggling with the things that afflict them. That is the church, friend. What that man did in that video, that is the church. I pray that your heart breaks for the things that break God's heart. I pray that it breaks wide open and causes you to get up out of your seat, get up off your couch. Get up out of your pew. Because this right here, this time we're doing together, this worship time, this gathering, this is just a rehearsal. The real work of being the church is when we walk outside those walls. When we walk out of our doors and we go into this community called Manassas and Prince William, and that, that is where we jump into action. That is where we jump into full-throated action of shining the light of Jesus into the world. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of the Lord's presence. Friends, I pray that you would hear that call to worship. Not just through shouting, not just through singing, but through acts of mercy and mission.